Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. As of 10 a.m. this morning, 5,877 people are hospitalized due to COVID-19 in Pennsylvania. 1,218 of them are in the intensive care. And we have 675 patients on a ventilator. The trend in the 14-day moving average of the number of hospitalized patients per day has increased by 4,400 since the end of September. Many hospitals across the state have few ICU beds, if any. The Keystone Region Healthcare Coalition and the Healthcare Coalition of Southwest Pennsylvania have had a third or more of its hospitals anticipate a staffing shortage for now the second time in 10 days. Today, we are reporting 11,972 new cases of COVID-19. This brings the total number of COVID-19 cases in Pennsylvania to 457,289. Of our total cases, the number of people who have recovered from COVID-19 continues to decline. Now, almost half of our cases have become infected in the last 30 days. We continue to see increases in the number of new cases in younger Pennsylvanians. Since the start of the pandemic, there have been 37,512 cases of COVID-19 among 5 to 18-year-olds. More than 9,500 of those, or a quarter of those cases, have been recorded in the last two weeks alone. Tragically, 248 new deaths have been reported today, for now a total of 12,010 deaths attributed to COVID-19. Each of the last two days, we have reported the highest number of deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. In the last week, we have reported close to 1,100 new deaths across Pennsylvania from COVID-19. Clearly, the impacts of this virus continue to strain our healthcare system and the vitality of our communities. COVID-19 is a respiratory virus and its spread can be difficult to track indoors. Dr. Meta Higa is a professor at York College and a virologist. And she joins us today to share how viruses such as COVID-19 spread and why it's so important to wear a mask and to social distance. Dr. Higa. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for that introduction. I'm sure by now many of us are growing tired of COVID-19 and the effects it has imposed upon our daily lives. My family and I continue to weigh every decision from how we do our grocery shopping to how to celebrate birthdays and holidays safely. We are tired too. First, there's good news. With vaccine distributions beginning shortly, we can at least see the end of the tunnel. And in the past year, scientists have been working nonstop to understand more about the virus, how it spreads, and how best to treat it. This research has resulted in better recovery rates for those infected and is being used to to inform decisions on how best to open up the economy while still mitigating spread of the virus. If we can keep up our efforts a bit longer, we should hopefully be able to relax a little bit once the vaccine is distributed widely. However, until then, The warmer months of summer are behind us and the colder climates mean that we are increasingly moving indoors. The data regarding virus spread indoors is well studied and clear. In closed spaces, in areas where people are less than six feet apart, and in areas of poor ventilation of outside fresh air, time and time again we see virus transmission. The outcomes are worse if we are singing or cheering like at a sporting event, or breathing heavily like we might do working out. In these studies, and there are many, transmission is seen between individuals with no contact, such as passengers on a bus, or restaurant patient patrons at adjacent tables. In the, rest, in the restaurant study, 50% of people dining at the same table as the infected individual were positive within seven days. At an adjacent table, were infected. In a meat processing plant, the infected person transmitted the virus to a colleague 
working more than 26 feet away over three consecutive working days. In that situation, low temperatures combined with recirculation of inside air throughout the hall, combined with the high physical workload of workers with heavy breathing, were suggested as factors that enabled transmission over longer distances. So should we shut down everything? Well, let me tell you one more story. There were two infected and symptomatic hairstylists and that ended up treating 139 clients between the two of them. They wore masks. Their clients wore masks properly over the nose and the mouth the entire time. Zero symptomatic cases were reported. And of the 67 clients that were tested, all of them ended up negative. So proper mask usage can work. It can reduce spread of the virus when worn properly by all parties. And of course, we need to continue to wash our hands to prevent spread from high touch surfaces to our mouth and our nose. But most important is to be highly aware of the environment and how we operate within it. Are we wearing masks at all times, including during meals? Eating and drinking will complicate that. Are we consistently greater than six feet apart? Is the ventilation with outside fresh air adequate? And how are we breathing or singing or cheering? And we need to understand that even under those perfect conditions, that does not eliminate the possibility of the spread of transmission. It merely lessens it. Believe in the science, please. Use good decision-making tactics and wear a mask. Thank you again, and I would be happy to take questions at the end. I am now happy to turn it over to Dr. Rue. Thank you, Dr. Higa, and uh, thank you to Secretary Levine and uh, Governor Wolf. Um, I thought I'd share, my name is Jay Wan Rue. I'm the president and CEO at Geisinger. I thought I'd share some of what we're seeing uh, with the recent rise in COVID activity and its impact specifically on Geisinger's responsibility to take care of the health needs of the communities that we serve. And really it's the health needs of the community, not just for the COVID patients, but even for the non-COVID patients, because as we all know, um, the heart attacks, the strokes, the, the GI bleed, um, those kinds of things are still happening in our communities. And we as hospitals and health systems uh, still have a responsibility to be available for that kind of care. COVID has frankly uh, stretched our ability to do that. Um, if I go through some of our numbers, I think they mirror some of the numbers you heard earlier uh, that the state is experiencing uh, throughout its territory. So in our hospitals over the last six weeks, we've seen a tripling um, of the COVID positive patients. And that's happened since um, about mid-October. And if you go back to Labor Day, it's actually sextupled, so times six. Um, and this recent wave, we're seeing a spike that's about double or more than double of what we did back in the spring. So I think the concerning trends and the rate of climb are truly things that give us tremendous pause. Um, the second point that we track pretty regularly is uh, positive daily tests. And if you look at what that's done, if you rewound the tape to the first half of November, we were about 200, maybe a little less than that positive tests per day in our system. For the second half of November, that climbed to 340. And for the first part of December, we're now at 470. So again, the trajectory um, of and the rate of climb of the virus and of the activity of the virus are things that make us very concerned. The positivity rate of the testing. So what percent of the tests that you do come back positive? We have been hovering between 23 and 26% as a system on that. And that's compared to the summer months where it was less than 3%. So again, these leading indicators uh, suggest that the seven to 14 days ahead and maybe even the weeks thereafter um, are going to be difficult for us. And um, what we've done at Geisinger, you know, several weeks ago, we started modulating and scaling back on our non-emergent procedures and services. Um, and on any given day, on any given campus, we've scaled that back between 10 and 50%. But despite that, beds are pretty tight. If you look at most of our campuses, we're operating pretty close to 100% of capacity at this point. 
um, which makes it very difficult and challenging to still be able to accommodate the needs of all those other care needs outside of COVID. I think it's also more concerning at this point because it's demonstrated that it truly is in the community. Um, I think you heard Secretary Levine share some numbers. It's remarkably similar to what we're seeing where it's not just the elderly, you know, 35 to 40% of the admitted patients we have in recent weeks have been younger than 65. Um, and roughly half of those have been younger than 55. And only about 10 to 20% of our recent cases have been from nursing homes. So it really demonstrates it's not coming solely from elderly patients, not coming solely from the nursing home, truly is out in the community. Now, there is some good news. I wanna make sure that uh, we uh, reiterate that as well. We have more arrows in our quiver, if you wanna think of it that way, as far as how we treat the virus versus where we were in the spring. But despite that, um, it is impacting our frontline caregivers as well. It's putting additional strain on our system. Um, and as I mentioned, our frontline caregivers and workers, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a big old shout out to our workers, but also even outside of Geisinger, all the healthcare workers out there, I think they, they just deserve a true shout out because they've risen to this occasion. But as I walk around and talk to our employees, I think the prevailing theme over the last couple of weeks has been this feeling like they're just bailing water, but there's still a big hole at the bottom of the boat. And somehow we have to figure out how to increase the number of buckets we have to bail, but more importantly, how to decrease the amount of water in these boats. And so uh, we have been out there um, really encouraging folks and the community that it's important to get upstream, to turn down the spigot so that we can shut off the valves that are putting more water into the boats. Um, and we think that that's going to make a big impact. In fact, uh, the biggest impact on our ability to continue to serve the care needs of our communities. And that's why we believe the upstream mitigation efforts are going to be needed. Um, I think Dr. Higa did a great job listing out some of where those higher risk environments are. Um, I think it's absolutely promising. We're very encouraged and excited about the vaccine soon coming on board here. But the distribution for that will still take months. And so in the meantime, you know, what do we do to reclaim the capacity that the health systems need to take care of our communities? That's where these upstream mitigation efforts um, can play a pivotal role. So I'll pull up there. I want to pass it along here, pass the baton to uh, my colleague, Dr. Chris De DeFlitch from Penn State Hershey, fellow ED doc. Uh, so I'll hand it over to him. Dr. Rue, thank you, uh, panelists. I appreciate you having here. Uh, first, I got to apologize. I literally just finished a shift uh, in our emergency department over here uh, at Penn State Health, and so um, apologize for the look. Uh, but I think I can give you a little bit of a view of, of, of real life. Um, first, um, thanks for having me here and, and allowing me to share a few comments about this um, this long marathon, this pandemic. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am to be a Pennsylvanian and how proud I am of the healthcare workers um, at Penn State Health and, and, and really across the Commonwealth. What we've been able to do for the people of Pennsylvania in, in trying situations. Um, it's been a long fight, it's 10 months. We've been doing this for 10 months and, and healthcare providers are tired. Um, but I, I think it's worthy of just taking a few minutes to remember all the things that have happened to get us to this point, many of which are amazing. So think about this, back in the spring, we had this virus, it was a novel virus. We had no idea what was going on with it. We're getting information left and right. And we worked through it together. We innovated together. We figured out how we could work as a team, our coworkers, our families, our neighbors, coming together and we kept saying, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. We heard that over and over and over again. We did it, okay? We did it. But this is a different time, okay? This curve and this surge is a completely different animal than what we talked about in the spring. But remember, we did learn a lot of things. We learned about how to care for patients in an ICU. We learned how to segregate out parts of our hospital and healthcare so that we have COVID units that are protecting patients with COVID and parts of ICUs and operating rooms that are ready for patients who need operative care or ICU care that's outside of COVID. We've learned 
what medications work when you need hospitalized, which makes sense for this patient and doesn't make sense for this patient who has COVID. We've actually learned a lot about home care of COVID. And I think one of the things that I think is one of the most important things that have developed in this time frame is the use of telemedicine. Penn State Health On Demand and other applications that are available for Pennsylvanians to use from their home, from the safety of their home, while still maintaining care with their care providers, getting acute care, uh, providing free coronavirus screenings and, and, and testing if needed, um, that probably would not have occurred without this. So we have risen to the challenge. But let me make, uh, oh, by the way, the virus vaccine is incredible. The time to get to a, a vaccine that really looks very promising and when it's available for us to be able to distribute to the, the very tired healthcare workers who are out there in the community, it, it, it's, just, it's just an amazing thing to get to this point. But, you know, there's a lot of experience. There's a lot of learning here, but it's 10 months later. And this surge is nothing like the spring surge. Uh, as doc, Dr. Rue pointed out, the volume is significant. Um, the number of patients, the variety of patients, the number of patients who are at home positive, the number of patients that are in hospitals and ICU positive is significant. And there are things we can do. I mean, we don't, this, this is not a bleak picture. This is another opportunity for Pennsylvania to come together to fight this infection. You've heard us talk about this before. We need to have the capacity of our healthcare systems to provide care for COVID patients and for non-COVID patients. And you know what to do. We've been talking about this for a long period of time. It's about wearing a mask and not sometimes wearing a mask, not partially wearing a mask, not covering your nose. It is about being diligent. It is about being persistent about wearing the mask and wearing the mask all the time. It's about washing your hands and washing those surfaces, especially in common areas. It's about doing the things you can do in your bubble with your family to maybe not spread around as much as you'd like to with the Thanksgiving or the other holidays or Hanukkah, you know, we can protect each other and ourselves with that. It is really, really, really important. These are actions that you can take today. And of course, social distancing, maintaining that social distancing, not relaxing, but maintaining that diligence associated with it. And I'll add a fourth, that vaccine is really important. We wanna protect ourselves. We wanna get immune as individuals and collectively we wanna produce community immunity. All of us together can do that. You know, on behalf of the healthcare workers who are working so diligently and are so tired, but remain so compassionate and remain so caring for all those patients that we take care of. I'm, I'm proud, I'm really proud um, to, to talk about that here. And, and if I can say anything to the public, one, thank you for what you've done in the spring. And it's really even more important for you to be diligent now about maintaining your hand washing, always wearing a mask, remain socially distant, and when available, get that vaccine. Thank you for having us at Penn State Health and myself here. And, and now I'd like to turn things over to Governor Wolf. Thank you, Dr. DeFlitch. I, I really appreciate that. And I, Dr. Rue, Dr. DeFlitch, Dr. Higa, thank you all for, for joining us today uh, in, in this um, announcement. And, and as always, Dr. Levine, uh, done tremendous work. I appreciate everything that, that you're doing. But, but again, thank you for, for being here. And, and to everybody out there, thank you for, for joining us. Um, first of all, let me just start saying, by now you've probably all heard that, that I uh, tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, I announced that, I guess, uh, yesterday. Uh, I actually pos tested positive on Tuesday at a routine test. Uh, all employees who are at the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency, which is where I hang out when I'm in Harrisburg, uh, are tested every Tuesday and, and uh, my test came back positive. Uh, I'm in isolation at home. I'm following CDC guidelines, the Department of Health, Pennsylvania Department of Health guidelines. Uh, so that's why uh, I am joining you like all these others remotely today. 
Uh, I'm feeling well. I'm continuing to perform all my duties, but but I had uh, was uh, tested positive or quarantined. Uh, my most recent test is negative, so I think I'm through this and, and uh, will uh, uh, stay in quarantine until uh, I'm I'm allowed to to come out or test out of it. But but uh, I'm feeling fine, and I appreciate uh, all the the well wishes that I've gotten from everybody. Um, but my test results are a reminder that even even if you follow every precaution, which I have. Uh, uh, there's not, a, there's no guarantee, as Dr. Higa said, there's no guarantee against getting uh, COVID-19. Um, and it's just a reminder that we all need to be working together now more than ever uh, to protect one another and, and stay safe. I think Dr. DeFlitch is right. We're, we're in a really unusual time here, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not like back in March. We know more about it. We're more prepared than ever. Uh, but this is, this is something that we've got to get through so that we can get back to life as we want it to be. This is so frustrating and so painful, but we can get there. <clears throat> and there is light at the end of the tunnel. The point is right now, the problem we're all facing is that this virus, virus continues to rage in Pennsylvania. And over the past several weeks, it's become clear that we need to take further mitigation actions to protect Pennsylvanians and stop the spread of COVID-19. We all hoped it would not come to this. I mean, that's, that's the point. The current state of the surge in Pennsylvania, though, will not allow us to wait. We need to slow the spread right now in order to save lives. If we don't, we're going to be in big trouble. So today I'm announcing additional temporary, temporary COVID-19 protective mitigation measures in the Commonwealth. The measures go into effect on Saturday, uh, January or December 12th at 12.01 a.m. Friday into, into uh, Saturday. And they expired Monday, January 4th at 8 a.m. With these measures in place, I hope that we accomplish three goals. First, I want to stop the devastating spread of COVID-19. Second, I want to keep our hospitals and our healthcare workers from becoming overwhelmed. Uh, as Dr. DeFlitch has said, we're, we're now in the ninth or 10th month of, of this pandemic. People are really tired. We're all tired, but our healthcare workers above all are really, really tired. And they, we want to make sure that they keep we keep them from being overwhelmed. The third thing is to help Pennsylvanians get through the holiday season and closer to a widely available vaccine, that is the light at the end of the tunnel, as safely as possible. This is a bridge to that better future that we all know we, we can get to in Pennsylvania. We know that COVID-19 thrives in places where people gather together. <clears throat> and therefore, these protective mitigation measures target high-risk environments and activities like those. And they aim to reduce the spread of this devastating virus. So here are the, here are the things that we're going to do starting Saturday. First, extracurricular activities at schools will be suspended, including tournaments and practices. Second, indoor gatherings and events will be limited to mo no more than 10 people. And outdoor gatherings and events will be limited to no more than 50 people. Third, indoor dining for this three-week period will be suspended. Takeout delivery and outdoor dining operations remain in place. And, and to support our restaurant industry, please do all you can to, to order online. Fourth, indoor operations will be suspended for this three-week period at theaters, at concert venues, museums, movies, uh, the uh, arcades, casinos, bowling alleys, private clubs, and all other similar entertainment, recreational, or social facilities as will indoor, op indoor operations at gyms uh, and other fitness facilities. Fifth, in-person businesses that serve the public like retail may only operate at up to 50% occupancy. Now I know this pandemic has been hard on businesses throughout the Commonwealth and it has been crushing, crushing for restaurants and bars. Unfortunately, COVID-19, that virus, thrives in places where people gather together. It spreads most easily when people are spending time together, talking, talking with each other, talking without masks on. And these are the same conditions that we find in restaurants and bars. This has been shown study after study. It's not the fault of the restaurant owner or the bar owner or their employees or their patrons. It's not their fault that COVID spreads easily in these conditions. It's just the nature of the disease. It's unfortunate. 
The vast majority of restaurant and bar owners have been responsible and highly conscientious throughout the entire pandemic. But this virus is insidious and it's spreading too quickly right now to make gathering indoors a safe activity. As much as we'd like it to be otherwise, it isn't otherwise, especially when it's not possible to wear a mask. I don't know how you wear a mask when you drink something or eat something. Since summer, I have repeatedly called on Congress to pass the Restaurants Act and direct COVID-19 relief funding to Pennsylvania's rest and bars industries. Uh, there's actually a, a good bill sitting in Washington that could do this, the Restaurant Act. Uh, but uh, we need uh, to make sure that these business owners and their employees have the, the help that they deserve and that they need to weather this pandemic. And we need our federal leaders to step up and provide the support these businesses need. That's a fact. The measures I'm announcing today are intended to be temporary. Again, they go into effect on Saturday, day after tomorrow, December 12th, and will remain in effect until Monday, January 4th. That's three weeks. For the next three weeks, please, I ask all of my fellow Pennsylvanians to stand with me united against COVID. I'm asking that we work together to turn the tide of this surge so that our communities can safely bridge the gap between where we stand today and when a vaccine is widely available. By working together to stop the spread over the next three weeks, we will be saving lives, but we have to do it together. Each of us has the power to make a difference in the lives of our fellow Pennsylvanians by taking small steps to reduce our own COVID transmission risk, our own footprint. We each have that power. We each have that agency. I strongly encourage Pennsylvanians to follow our stay at home advisory. I understand that there's perhaps nothing more important than human interaction, especially within families. You know, when you're not able to see members of your family, that is not a small thing, that's a big thing. But we need to stay safe. So before you leave home, ask yourself, do I really need to make this trip? Do I need to really leave? And if you have to, then think about how you can do it as safely as possible. Wear a mask. Keep your distance from others who don't live in your household. Uh, as Dr. Higa said, avoid poorly ventilated spaces and wash your hands frequently. The point is the situation we're in right now is dire. It's worse than it was in the spring when we first took action to flatten the curve. With so many cases circulating in the community right now, the kinds of everyday activities or small gatherings that might have felt low risk in the summer are substantially much riskier today. But every time we do one of the little things that lets us be safer, we're working together for that brighter future and it's gonna get here sooner. A study recently published in the journal uh, called Health Affairs demonstrates that a vaccine is gonna be able to protect our communities better and faster if the virus is already under control when the, when the vaccine arrives. That means the work we do now to slow the spread of COVID is not only crucial to keeping our fellow Pennsylvanians safe and healthy right now, it's gonna help us all get back to normal as quickly as possible. And it means more Pennsylvanians will be alive to celebrate that brighter future that's coming. This year, we show our love for our families and friends by celebrating safely and protecting one another. Let's work together right now to stop the spread of this virus. Because when we wear our masks, when we stay safe at home, when we avoid gatherings, we actually save lives. We get our own lives and give our, get our own lives a few steps closer to that normal that we all want to get to. When we do the small things that keep each other safe, we aren't just fighting against COVID-19, we're actually fighting for a safer world and for safer holidays next year. We're fighting for next year's birthday celebrations. We're fighting for next year's family gatherings, graduations, weddings, bar and bat mitzvahs, parties, dinners out. We're fighting for the safety to get our kids back into classrooms and visit our families. We're fighting for the special occasions and the everyday moments we're all missing so badly this year. Together, we're fighting for a world where our friends, our neighbors, 
and family members are alive and healthy to spend holidays with us next year and for many years to come. So let's do this together, Pennsylvania.